So as described and as advertised, I want to use the time that we have today to talk a little bit about how we are using new technology to better understand, predict, and prevent suicidal behavior. So this being a Grand Rounds presentation, I don't want to take too much time talking about uh, the problem of suicide and how big of a problem it is. I would, I assume, but I'm curious to see how many people here are clinicians who work with potentially, okay, everyone, potentially suicidal patients stu and students. How many people are working with suicidal students in schools? Smaller but significant portion. Okay, so you all are well acquainted with the topic, so I, I won't take too much time talking about what a big problem this is and how complicated and how complex a problem it is. Other than to say, this is something that we've been struggling with. It's not a new problem. We've been struggling with it since the beginning of recorded history. For thousands of years, people have written about suicide and about how big of a problem it is. And it was first tried, it was tried to uh, be tackled by philosophers, later by religion, later by law, and now it's pretty squarely in the domain of, of mental health professionals to better understand. It continues to be a huge public health problem. Suicide's currently the 10th leading cause of death in the US, second leading cause of death among uh, those ages 10 to 35 years old. And whereas this, the rate of other leading causes of death has dropped precipitously over the past 100 years, if you look at a chart of the past 100 years and look at the mortality rate due to things like tuberculosis, pneumonia, cancer, accidents, they've all dropped enormously over the past 100 years due to advances in science and medicine. The suicide rate now is virtually identical to what it was 100 years ago. So we see little uh, ebbs and flows, but we haven't had a big impact in the area of suicide like we have in other areas. We have made some progress. So we've identified some important risk factors like mental disorders. 90 to 95% of people who die by suicide have a diagnosable mental disorder. We've identified some promising interventions like dialectical behavior therapy and cognitive therapy. But I would argue progress has been unacceptably slow and in many ways stagnant. And I have colleagues who would disagree with this and say, no, 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 we're making great progress, as they are wont to do. I'm reminded of W. Edwards Deming, who said, of course, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So I brought some data to, to bring to bear on this question. What I'm gonna show is, is quickly results from a meta-analysis that our research team did with, with the primary question of how are we doing in the prediction of suicidal here attempts and death. So what we did was look at every single scientific paper we could find over the past 50 years that tried to predict suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts, and suicide deaths. And what we wondered is, are we getting better? If we look at the results, and they're binned here by 10, the first bin is 20 year period, and then 10 years, 10 years, 10 years, and how many prediction cases are included, and by prediction case we mean an analysis. We have an, an independent variable, we're trying to predict suicide as an outcome. What's the magnitude of our effects? So I'm going to show our odds ratios, which effectively is what is the increase in the odds or likelihood of the outcome given the presence of a specific risk factor? An odds ratio of one means no difference. The, the risk factor, it is not a risk factor. The independent variable had no effect. The higher it climbs above one, the bigger the impact, the bigger the predictive power of our risk factor. So what we want to see is, are we getting better and better? So over the years, are we identifying more and more powerful predictors? What do we find? we find that we're not getting better. In fact, these, these bars are pretty flat and they look a little bit like they're coming down over time. And this is probably because with more cases, we're getting more accurate in our, in our uh, estimation of the true effects. But the truth is we're a little bit better than chance at using factors to predict the occurrence of suicide attempts and death. So we've made some progress, but we leave much to be desired. I say as a, as a suicide researcher myself. So why might this be? Well, if you look across the same past 50 years and say, well, what risk factors have we been testing? It turns out we've been looking at the same risk factors over and over and over again. And we, we classify here the top five categories of risk factors over the past 50 years. They're exactly the same every decade over the past 50 years. We're looking at demographics. Women think about suicide more, make more attempts. Men die by suicide more often. Internalizing, externalizing symptoms, basically DSM disorders are strong predictors. Having prior self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, having stressful life events, all of these things predict suicidal outcomes. We know, and we've known that for 50 years. And in fact, about 75 to 80% of all the analyses that we've run over the past 50 years in the published literature have focused on these five types of risk factors, largely using self-report questionnaires and in-person interviews. So it's perhaps not surprising that if we're using the same predictors and we're using the same methods, we shouldn't be surprised that we're getting the same results over and over again. So we've made some progress, but we're a little bit stagnant, I think, in our 
uh, approach. So we need new directions, we need new approaches. What directions could we take? What could we be doing differently as researchers, as clinicians, to try and better understand and predict and prevent? There are lots of things, of course, that we can do. What I'm gonna talk about today, and what I'm gonna to propose today, is that we can take advantage of recent developments in computing and technology to start making bigger advances in our uh, abilities regarding suicidal behaviors. Why use new technologies? Well, quite frankly, they've helped us really transform the way that we live our lives in so many other areas. A few quick, simple examples. If you think about how we solve mathematical problems, for a very long time in the history of humankind, up until fairly recently, our most cutting edge technology for solving mathematical problems looked like this. Some of you may remember this device. I certainly used it in kindergarten and first grade when I was learning math. And now, with advances in technology, we solve complex mathematical problems with supercomputers. And this has changed the way that we live virtually every aspect of our lives. If we think about travel, I came from Boston to be here today for a very long time. Up until relatively recently, if I went to travel a far distance, my lab members and I would trek across the plains and go somewhere. And now, we have new technologies that are planes and allow us to travel the world and change the way we interact with others, that we tr uh, trade goods, and so on. Moving closer to, to the domain of health, if we had, if one had a significant health problem, you lost a limb. Up until not too long ago, our most cutting edge technology looked like this. And in just the past few years, we now have appendages that are controlled, that are robotic and controlled by the human brain. Fascinating. Huge progress has been made, changing the way that people are able to live their lives. What about mental health? How do we know if someone is depressed or anxious or suicidal, and how do we intervene? For a very long time, our interventions looked like this, and of course, now they look like this. So we just haven't made the same progress. We haven't capitalized on the advances that are, are, are now available to us. And what I would argue is the time is now right for the convergence between what we're doing as, as mental health clinicians, and I'm a clinician myself, which is trying to understand and predict and prevent really, really complex problems. This is not simple stuff. And the recent advances in technologies and computing that might help us uh, move forward in, in new ways. So how might we do this? What might this look like? What I'm not advocating is that we grab some new technologies because they are new and cool and interesting and we see if they might work. What I'm proposing is that we identify some of the huge gaps in our understanding, suicide and related problems, and see if there's a way that we can use recent advances to try and gain some traction. I'm gonna talk with the time that I have today, I'll spend 10 or 15 minutes on each of these, about three areas that for my money are some of the biggest limitations, the biggest gaps in understanding. One is, as clinicians, we need methods for better combining information about known risk factors. We also need objective markers of suicide risk. We can't go on relying only on what people tell us about their, their thoughts and their risk. And finally, we really need data on imminent risk. We need to know what's gonna happen with our patients today, tomorrow, the next day. So these are huge gaps in our understanding as clinicians of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. We can see these as gaps in understanding, or we can think of them using our cognitive reframing techniques as opportunities for advancement. And so again, I'm gonna spend just 10 or 15 minutes talking about each of these topics, uh, talking about some recent scientific advances and trying to draw out either what's applicable clinically today or, or how we think clinical care might look in the, in the next few years if we use these approaches. And I wanna make sure to leave a lot of time for questions uh, in case you have them. So, Starting with number one, we, we have identified a lot of risk factors for suicide. This is a figure that you probably can't read the, the words in the bottom, but it shows the strongest risk factors from that meta-analysis I mentioned earlier for suicide death. We have, uh, our most powerful predictor is being in treatment, not because treatment necessarily kills people, but the most severe patients are getting themselves into treatment, not surprisingly. After that, family history, psychopathology, prior self-injury, physical disorders, uh, and so on. Don't worry about which, which is which. The point I'd like to uh, highlight here is all of these risk factors have about the same impact. They're slightly above one. So the point here is each risk factor, our strongest risk factors, slightly tick up a person's risk, but there's no silver bullet. There's no one risk factor that does it. There's no one thing to look out for. Depression is one that people often think about. Depression, I won't go into detail on this, but we have significant data on this. Depression's a really powerful, powerful predictor of thinking about suicide. 
Among people with suicidal thoughts, depression doesn't predict who's going to act on those thoughts. It's other, other disorders that do, disorders characterized by anxiety, poor behavioral control, things like anxiety disorders, conduct disorders, substance use disorders. It's the piling up of risk factors that really seems to be important. Unfortunately, the research literature hasn't told us much beyond individual risk factors. Literally 99% of the studies that have been published in the analysis section looks at the effect of one risk factor at a time. So how, as clinicians, are we supposed to measure all of these risk factors, weight them, combine them, and make a prediction about a person's risk in a given case? It's impossible for the human brain to do. So we need methods that can do that. Computers can do this. Advances in technology can help us do this. And I'm going to walk through just a few quick examples of studies that have been published in just the past few years that are starting to provide uh, the tools to help us be able to do this clinically. So this first study is one done by my colleague Ron Kessler at Harvard Medical School. And the problem that we were trying to solve in this study was we're trying to predict who's going to die by suicide after they leave a psychiatric hospitalization. As you may or may not know, the suicide rate skyrockets in the weeks after discharge from a psychiatric hospitalization. In the one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, right after discharge, there's a huge increase in, in risk, and we don't know why, and we don't know who's at greatest risk. So what we wondered is, can we do a better job of finding out who's at risk after hospitalization? Can we use recently de developed and expanded machine learning methods to look across electronic health records and identify which patients are most at risk for suicide? And the way we did this was getting a sample of over 50,000 hospitalizations, and these are data from the US Army. This is a study that we're doing with the Army because the suicide rate among Army soldiers has increased dramatically in the past decade, but the approach is relevant more generally. In plain English, what we did was look at existing medical records and administrative records for this large sample of people. So we didn't ask any patient a single question. We said, there is data lying dormant in their medical record that we can probably use and capitalize on. So let's use statistical learning methods, machine learning methods, to comb across those records, look at thousands of risk factors, potential risk factors at a time, combine that information, and give each person a risk score at each hospitalization, a predicted probability of dying by suicide over the next year. And the way we did that was by taking a sample of the data, developing a model, and then testing in the rest of the data how well that model does. And so what we wondered is, if we give each patient a risk score and then follow them for a year, do the patients with the highest risk scores have the highest risk of dying by suicide? And so we did exactly that. And what I'm going to show are 20 bins. This is the top 5% of risk scores, the next 5%, the next 5%, the next 5%, the last 5%. And what we want to see is, is, is are the is the rate of suicide death over the year after discharge normally distributed, or is it really piling up in the high-risk group? And what we find is it really piles up in the high-risk group. The top 5% of people accounted for 50% of all suicides over the next year. So whereas the suicide rate in the Army is about 18 people per 100,000, in this group it's 3,800 per 100,000. So if you think about this, people talk about suicide prediction as looking for a needle in the haystack. What we did effectively in this approach is separate all of the patients into 20 haystacks. The, the top haystack had half of the needles, half of the suicide deaths. That's great. The downside is 3,800 per 100,000, while much higher than 18, is only about 4,000 per 100,000. So only about four people out of every 100 that we said were at risk actually died by suicide. So we still have a lot of false positives, which is something we need to keep in mind. An interesting wrinkle in the story, though, is Although only four out of 100 people in that high-risk group died by suicide, 46 out of 100, nearly half, if they didn't die by suicide in the next year, they died by accident, they had a suicide attempt, or they had a rehospitalization. So a lot of these negative outcomes, so to speak, tend to cluster together, which suggests that we might be able to very soon start using algorithms like this, approaches like this, to identify high, patients at high risk of a lot of negative outcomes so we can do a more efficient job of targeting them for enhanced intervention. Again, this is all done without talking to a single patient. This is just making use of all of the electronic data that are sitting in EPIC and other medical records just waiting for us to, to use. This is done in the Army. We recently did a study with uh, my colleagues Jordan Smoller and Ben Rice, also at Harvard Medical School, in uh, a, health, a, a civilian healthcare sample, that, the partners, Harvard Healthcare System. Two million patients used a similar machine learning approach across medical records, electronic records and we were able to predict about 40% of future suicide attempts and death about three years before they occurred, suggesting we can do this with a pretty big window for potential intervention.
And we've just recently, we haven't published this yet, but we are just finishing up a paper where we tested whether this generalizes. This worked in the Harvard healthcare system, but does it work in other healthcare systems? And so we shared this approach with five other healthcare systems around the country. They used the same approach, and they got virtually identical data, which suggests this does generalize. So this, this is an approach that maybe in the coming years, I don't want to overpromise, but in the coming years, this is something that could be available uh, to help us better target which patients in our system are at greatest risk. So this approach can help us better identify people at risk, but it can also help us do the work of identifying new risk factors. So this is a plot of what are the key risk factor categories that, that came out in the recent study I was just telling you about but with Jordan Smoller and Ben Rice. And so we looked at literally thousands of potential risk factors in the medical record, basically ICD codes, lab reports, uh, billing codes, everything that's in there gets in, put into the model and we see where is the biggest risk. This just shows uh, a dozen or so risk categories, and these on the, on the vertical axis is the odds ratio. So this is called a, uh, something like a Manhattan plot, because it's intended to look like the Manhattan skyline or Chicago skyline, where we see, where we see big hits. This is, looks like a tall building. So infections, neoplasms, immune problems, no real hits. Mental disorders, we see a lot of hits, things like substance use, personality disorder, alcohol use disorder, as you all know, all increase a person's risk. What I want to point out is, there's also some hits down here in dermatology, in injury and poisoning. What are these? These are things that, these are codes for skin infections, burning injuries, crushing injuries, wound injuries. These are ones that weren't coded as being self-inflicted. They were accidental injuries, but they indicate significantly higher risk, or they predicted higher risk of making a suicide attempt or dying by suicide. Why, we don't know for certain. These might be intentional episodes of self-injury or suicide attempts that when a person came to the hospital, it said it was an accident, but it gets coded in the medical record. And so the idea is we can use approaches like this to find new risk factors that can then improve our ability to identify who's at risk in, in ways that don't rely on what people are telling us. And that brings me to the second thing I want to talk about, which is the need for identifying objective markers of risk. So a huge limitation scientifically and clinically is that we rely largely on what people tell us in psychiatry and psychology and mental health to know whether they're at risk. And we should rely on that. So if you want to know if a person's at risk for suicide, you should ask them. There is now over a decade of data suggesting that two thirds of people who die by suicide told others they were thinking about death or suicide before they died. And there's also experimental data showing clearly Asking people about suicide does not increase their distress. It does not increase the risk of suicide. So you 100%, if you think someone is at risk for suicide, should ask them in a calm, dispassionate way. And if someone says, yes, I'm thinking about suicide, you should always take that very seriously. What I'm arguing, though, is we can't rely only on that. We can't stop there. Relying only on self-report is problematic for a number of reasons. People are often motivated to deny or conceal thoughts of suicide for fear of being intervened upon. They might not want to be put in a the hospital. They might not, want to, might, might not want to be stopped. We also know, and I'll show some data in a moment on this fact, that suicidal thoughts tend to be transient in nature. They tend to ebb and flow. So they may be present one minute, but absent the next on self-report. And we also know from decades of work in social and cognitive psychology that we all lack access to all of the unconscious forces that are influencing our behavior. And we also know that we're, as humans, pretty bad predictors of what we're going to do and how we're going to feel in the future. And there's a lot of social psychology research demonstrating this. All of these factors have to be taken into account. And we know they're at play here because although two thirds of people who die by suicide told someone ahead of time they were thinking about suicide, Nearly four out of five explicitly, of people who die by suicide, explicitly denied suicidal thoughts or intentions in their last assessment before dying. So how do we square this? We need methods of assessing suicide risk, I would argue, that don't just rely on self-report. So for instance, we have a patient in front of us who's saying, I don't want to kill myself. We should take that seriously. But what we also might want to know is, what is this person thinking that they may not be saying? What are their unspoken thoughts or their implicit cognitions. Implicit cognitions are those that don't rely on conscious introspection and explicit self-reporting. And these are things that we've always wanted to know. We've always wanted to know since the dawn of humans, what are other people around me thinking that they may not be saying? We want to know this in clinical contexts. We want to know this in all contexts. Fortunately, over the past few decades, social and cognitive psychologists have developed ways of measuring implicit cognition, the contents of a person's mind, so to speak, in ways that 
don't rely on self-report, but use a person's behavior. Use tests of memory or reaction time, for instance. One such test is called the Implicit Association Test, or IAT, and I'll spend a few minutes describing this. Who is familiar with the IAT? No one. One person. Wonderful. Pardon my brief description of the IAT. You can do something else in this next two minutes. Uh, the IAT is a brief reaction time test that uses the speed with which you classify different stimuli to measure the associations you hold about these stimuli, which probably means nothing to you. So I'll give an example. Uh, so it's a three minute test that asks you to classify words or images as being on the left of the screen or the right of the screen. And what it does is capitalize on the fact that humans are faster making categorizations of things that are like each other. So for instance, if you're seated at a computer screen and I'm gonna show you uh, images or words on the screen, and I'm often, the test was developed to study things like race bias or political bias, and I'll often use a political example. I won't in the current context, I'll use a simple or uh, non-controversial example. Let's say I'm gonna ask you to classify uh, jockeys and basketball players and short words and tall words. And so what I want you to do is push you, your left button on your key, on your, on your computer keyboard, if you see a jockey or a short word, push the right key if you see a basketball player or a tall word. And you'll make those classifications as soon as you can, and as quick as you can, you'll see them one at a time, and we'll measure your response time in milliseconds. You'll do that for say 40 trials. Now we flip it. Now push the left key for jockey and tall, push the right key for basketball and short, and you go as fast as you can. A pretty reliable finding is you're gonna be faster on that first pairing, because humans are faster pairing things that are like each other. Jockey short, jockey short, basketball tall, that's easy. If I ask you to pair jockey tall, basketball short, that gets to be hard because you don't associate those things as being like each other. Simple test of association. It's been used to study how people think about people who are considered to be white versus black, male versus female, Republican versus Democrat, and so on. And we show pretty reliable differences. People differ in milliseconds on how they make this classification, and it tells us a little bit about how they're thinking. What we wondered is, can we use this test to measure if and how people are thinking about suicide? And so the screen that a person sees looks just like this, and instead of jockey, basketball player, tall, short, we use the concepts of death and life, and the attributes of, is it like me or not like me? And I'll show you a, a sample of what this looks like. So for instance, you're gonna see words appear on the screen. If you were taking this test for real, you'd have a finger on two keys, a left key and a right key, the E key and the I key. And if you see a death word, dead, dying, suicide, or a me word, I, me, mine, you hit the left key. If you see a life word, life, living, surviving, or not me, they, them, theirs, you hit the right key. And the idea here is, if you're somebody who's thinking about death, who wants to be dead, who identifies with death, you should be faster responding when death and me are paired than when life and me are paired. So I'll show you a quick sample of what this looks like. If you are so inclined, feel free to play along and say left or right, just to get a sense of how this classification task works. I am not recording any of your responses. So you'll see the word suicide, you push the left. Left, right. Right, right, left, left. Okay, if you make a mistake, you get a little red X and then you just classify it in the correct place and you do this, people do this for a few minutes. Now we flip it, now life and me are paired together and you do the same task. Left, left, right, right. Okay, so you go through uh, a few dozen trials, and what we do is take your reaction time in milliseconds for death me pairing, subtract it from the life me pairing, and divide by the standard deviation of all your response latencies, which gives us a one score for you. To, and what I'm gonna show is to what extent do you identify with life versus death? What we did was set up shop in the emergency room, administer this task to a few hundred people, and follow them for six months during this post-hospital period to see do people who score high on this test are they more likely to make a suicide attempt than people who score lower on this test? And it turns out they are. So on the left is, for people who responded more quickly when life and me are paired, about 10% made a suicide attempt over the next six months. For people who responded more quickly when death and me were paired, three times as many made a suicide attempt over the next six months. We also, for every person we saw 
ask their clinician, we use their chart diagnosis to see how, that, how well that predicted. We, used, we asked every clinician, what's the likelihood this patient is going to make a suicide attempt? We asked every patient, what's the likelihood you're going to make a suicide attempt over the next six months? And then we said, even putting all of those things into the model, does the IAT improve prediction? And it does. Clinicians, I'm a clinician, we're no better than chance at predicting who's going to make a suicide attempt or not. Patients are slightly better than chance at making that prediction. The IAT significantly improved that prediction with pretty good sensitivity and even better specificity, meaning we captured a fair number, half of the attempts and 80% of the non-attempts. We classified them accurately. Replication is, of course, very important in science. This could just be a one-off lucky finding. So we sent this task to other colleagues. The first ones who replicated it were a group in Canada, and they had virtually identical findings, very similar odds ratio. They used a three-month rather than a six-month follow-up. Uh, very similar sensitivity and specificity, suggesting that this is a robust finding that replicates across clinical settings. We wanted to see whether this effect exists in the general population. And so we created a website that is still up and running. If anyone's interested, you can go and take this test. Uh, it's called implicitmentalhealth.com. There are IATs about suicide, self-injury, anxiety, depression, eating disorders. It's meant for anyone. It's a public education website. You can take these tests anonymously and get your score. And we have we thought a lot about this. Should we give people their score or should we not? You have the option to take the test and not get your score or take the test and get your score so you can see your feedback. And so what we did is we've administered these now to thousands of people. And in one paper we did uh, a year or so ago, we took data from 6,000 people. We randomly split them in half and ran our analyses in half of them, replicated them the other half just to make sure this effect is reliable. And we found significant differences between suicidal and non-suicidal people in their IAT scores. These are all negative. These scores are negative, which means, in general, people are faster responding when life and me are paired. But that life equals me bond is weaker in people who make a suicide attempt. So it's not necessarily that they're uh, on the death equals me end, but their, their link with, their identification with life is weakened. And the more recently someone made a suicide attempt, the weaker their score, which suggests, suggests this is not a trait that stays there consistently, but it's something that, that changes, that might ebb and flow over time. A really nice feature of this test, speaking of technology, is that it can be used on any computer, any iPad, any smartphone. And so what we're doing moving forward is administering this task and others like it on people's um, smartphones to see if, if scores on this task change as people move about the world. And this brings me to the final portion of the talk, uh, the need to identify uh, imminent risk of suicide in a better way. What I, I would assume, again, as a clinician myself, if you are like me, what you want to know about is what is this patient's risk for suicide right now? It's nice that we can predict over the next year or two years or three years whether a person's going to be at risk of suicide. What I want to know as a clinician is I have a patient in front of me. Are they going to try and kill themselves today or tomorrow or the next day or let's say the next month, within the next month. What has the research literature told us about doing short-term prediction? Well, if we go back to this meta-analysis, we see the answer is not much. What this chart shows is what percentage, oh, sorry, what percentage of studies have looked at what amount of time period from when a risk factor was measured until the outcome of suicide was predicted. And what we see is about a quarter of studies try to predict over a period of 10 years or more they measure a risk factor and then try and predict suicide in 10 or 11 or 12 years. Another quarter, look at five to 10 years. Another 30%, a year to five years. A smaller percent, but 7%, one to six months. What percentage of studies try and predict suicide and so can tell us about suicide prediction over a period of zero to 30 days? One-tenth of 1% 1 of all studies. So literally 99.9% .9 of all studies have looked at this time window that's simply too long for us as clinicians to, to use on a, on a daily basis. So we need more studies and stronger studies of short-term prediction. We haven't been arming ourselves with uh, the information we need to do accurate suicide prediction. Now, this has led to huge limitations in our understanding. Uh, and if you think about it, this is the way that we've been trying to do suicide science is very different to how we do science in virtually every other area. If you want to understand something, the movement of planets, the behavior of ants, chemical reactions, what do you do? 
you carefully observe that thing and you understand its properties. We haven't done that with suicide. We haven't done it because we haven't been able to observe people as they're actually suicidal. I, a lot of my work happens in a research lab. We can't ethically bring people into a research lab and induce suicidal thinking or behavior and study it because we shouldn't and we, and we, and we can't. So we've missed the opportunity to actually see, well, what do suicidal thoughts look like as they unfold? If a patient says they're thinking about suicide, how, do those thoughts change over time? Are they consistently high? Are they consistently low? Do they vary? Do they vary over days, hours, weeks, months, minutes? We just don't know. We've had no data on this. We are starting to get data on this because over the past few years, we all have effectively become cyborgs, right? We all, if I, I'm not gonna ask, but I, I would bet Everyone or virtually everyone in this room has a smart device in their pocket. You might be wearing a smart watch on your wrist. Some of you might even be wearing the Google Glass or some other kind of thing where we can use these devices, or they are being used, whether we like it or not, or know it or not, they are being used to collect data from us continuously. We as healthcare professionals and healthcare researchers can capitalize, it, capitalize on this and do what my colleague JP Onella has called digital phenotyping or doing a moment-by-moment -moment quantification of the individual level phenotype or subtype or physical manifestation of people in situ or in place out in the wild using data from personal digital devices. So the idea is, plainly, we can capture really fine-grained dynamic changes in people's thoughts and feelings and behaviors in real time. Might this allow us to understand when a person, when a patient is moving into a depressive episode or into a manic episode or into a suicidal crisis, what does that literally, objectively look like? Scientifically and clinically, this will decrease the influence of recall bias. What we've been doing historically is asking people, when, have you ever thought of suicide? If so, when was that? A month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago? What was happening at the time? This creates huge bias in our, in our models. This will also allow us to observe suicidal thoughts as they actually unfold in nature. What we've been doing as a science in psychology is bringing people into these really artificial lab-based set settings and studying behaviors that we think will generalize out into the world, but we don't know. And this approach using data like this will allow us to test how ecologically valid our existing theories are about suicide. And I'm not gonna present data on this today, but we've started to test some of the theories that are out there, and they just don't hold up when we use uh, real-time data. And I think more fruitfully, this approach will allow us to generate new theories about how and why suicidal thoughts unfold. And most importantly, in my book, will provide opportunities for intervening before people become suicidal. Virtually all of the treatments that we have right now, DBT, cognitive therapy, that have been shown in randomized trials to be effective for suicidal behavior, have actually shown an ability to decrease, to cut in half, people's suicide reattempt, cut in half the, the, the probability of another suicide attempt after enrolling people who have made a suicide attempt. What we don't have evidence for are treatments that can prevent suicide attempts from happening. So might we be able to capitalize on the fact that our patients are walking around with smartphones and smartwatches and social media accounts to monitor more closely in real time and deploy interventions in real time to help people when and where and how they need it. So people have devices. Most of our patients, most of our participants, most of us have these devices. What we have started to do is survey studies where we ping people uh, four to six times a day on their smartphones and ask them surveys about suicide. And what we've done initially is find people who say, I'm having serious thoughts of suicide and I will agree to be in a, in a research study where you ping me with this brief survey four or six times a day for so far a 30 day period. And so these are people who are recruited to participate in a research study. They've all said, I'm having thoughts of suicide. So our first question is, what does that look like? How do suicidal thoughts change over the course of days? So when I say we ping people, we send them surveys. They get a little ping, like, a, like a, the little pop-up you get saying you got a text message. And we, it says you have a survey. And we do a quickie little survey. It takes them one or two minutes to do. And among other things, we ask them about how strong is your desire to kill yourself, your intention to kill yourself, your ability to resist the urge to kill yourself. And one thing we wondered is, at a really basic level, what do, these, what do people's suicidal thoughts look like? Again, how variable are they within people and across people? So one of the first things we did is just plot out for a sample of about 50 people who say they're suicidal, what do their suicidal thoughts look like over a one-month period? 
And this is what they look like. So each box is a different person. And on the horizontal axis is one month passage of time. And on the vertical axis is severity of suicidal thinking. So each of these assessment points is a few hours away. So this is four or six times a day over a one month period. And what we see is there's a lot of variability within people. And there seems to be a lot of variability across people. So every person with suicidal thoughts does not look the same in terms of the variation in their suicidal thinking. This is work led by my uh, former postdoc, Evan Kleiman, who's now a professor at Rutgers. What Evan and I did was literally print out all of these sheets and put them on the floor of our lab and stare at them for a few hours to see, do we see any patterns in the data? Are there any subtypes of suicidal thinking? We didn't see any. I, I really hope that you don't see any in this quick 30 seconds because we wasted several hours of our lives doing so, if so. What I'm going to show you is we, we submitted these data to something called a latent profile analysis, which is essentially using a computer program to look for patterns in the data to see are there any latent or underlying profiles. So what I'm going to show are the exact same boxes reordered. We did see five different, pro five different profiles. What we saw is profiles that varied based on the mean level of suicidal thinking and the amount of variability. So people colored in green on top said, yes, I have thoughts of suicide, but on this 0 to 12 scale, the ratings were 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, you know, very low and not a lot of variability. People in yellow, low mean, higher variability. So they were peakier. They were mostly had low scores, but at some points they shot up to 7, 8, 10. People in purple, moderate mean with a moderate degree of variability. People in red, high mean, low variability. They're never coming down to zero. They're persistently at 7, 8, 9, 10. And people in blue, high mean, but with high variability. They're coming down. They're having some periods of relief. Which do you think would be most likely to have recently made a suicide attempt? Any guesses? You can Blue, that's the most commonly endorsed response. Actually red, the red people were most likely to have recently made a suicide attempt. So this is just one study. We actually replicated this in a second sample, did a latent profile analysis separately, got the same five subtypes, which suggests maybe this is a helpful, reliable way to classify, to think about different types of suicidal thinking. What we're doing now is following people over much longer periods of time to see, to ask the questions that you might be asking now. How do, this is just one month. Do people move from green to yellow to purple? Is red the highest risk group of making a suicide attempt in the future? We just don't know. And so this is what we're um, trying to tackle moving forward. This is an, an iterative process and an early step. We're also incorporating the use of passive monitoring. So this is, this is all still relying on self-report. We're asking people to report actively on their suicidal thinking. In the background, what we've been doing with people's consent, not completely in the background, is putting apps on people's phones that collect information uh, just passively. It captures data from, that your phone is already collecting on your GPS, your accelerometer, so how much are you moving around, your call and text logs. We're not listening in on phone calls or reading text. We're just seeing how many calls and for how long, how many texts and how long are, they, are you making, and are people responding, and are you seeing reciprocity? Is the person, if you're texting Jenny, is Jenny texting you back? So are you seeing social reciprocity? And so we're able to look at, for instance, these are Bluetooth data, just to show an example. This is data for one person on two different days. This is a slide from my colleague, JP Onella, who created this wonderful uh, monitoring app called BeWe to do exactly this kind of work. And so this is person on, on one day. You can imagine this being overlaid onto like a Google map. Uh, color is time of day, so blue is night, red is daytime, and the more you stay in one place, the bigger that dot gets. So this is a person who was sleeping, and then it looks like traveled to work. You see like little subway stops along the way. They spent their time at work, they went home, and there's a little blue loop where they walk their dog. This is a different day. They didn't go very far from home. It turns out this is JP's research assistant. This is a day where she traveled to work and then traveled back home again. This is a weekend day. She didn't go very far. So by themselves, not especially meaningful. But you could imagine over many, many days, this might signify healthy activity. People are out about. They're living their lives. They're going to the store. They're seeing friends. This might, might be indicative of, say, a depressive episode where a person gets more, or an anxious episode where a person becomes more socially isolated. In themselves, they're not going to be predictive, but maybe an important piece of the puzzle that, again, could be just passively collected from a person's phone. We're looking at call and text data. These are call and text logs for about uh, two dozen patients over the course of a hospital stay. Gray boxes are this person didn't call or text anyone. And the deeper the color, 
from red to blue. So the more blue, the more calls and texts sent and received. So these folks did no calling or texting until right before discharge and so on. In a first simple analysis, we looked and found the greater the number of texts that you sent and received on a given day, the lower your suicidal thinking on that day. So the more connected to others you are, the less suicidal. The less connected, the more suicidal. Simple first pass. We're now going to start looking at things like social reciprocity, how connectedness across days might predict suicidal episodes, and so on. And we're also collecting biosensor data from people. We're equipping people with these uh, wrist-worn devices. They look like they're beefed up Fitbits. In this case, we use a device called the Empatica E4, which collects data from electrodermal activity, so skin conductance, heart rate variability, accelerometer, skin temperature. And we continuously get data from people. And they push a button on their device whenever they have thoughts of suicide. And so what we're doing is looking channel by channel to see, are these different streams of data telling us whether a person's going to have a thought of suicide or whether they're going to make a suicide attempt? These are data from me. I collected this just over a weekend. This is, I was at my daughter's soccer game, so I hit the button. So these are no individual patient's data. <laughs> Clearly, nothing was happening in the soccer game when I, hit the, when I hit the button. But looking at these data to see how well do they predict suicide ID. So can we use a person's data from Thursday to predict whether they think about suicide on Friday? So we did initial analysis where we used a suite of machine learning methods to look across the data to see how well can we predict tomorrow's ideation across people using electrodermal activity. And these are uh, values for AUC curves. I won't get into the details of this other than to say scores can range from, so 0.5 is no better than chance. The closer you are to one, the more accurate prediction. So using a person's skin conductance data hasn't been so helpful. Heart rate variability, more helpful. Accelerometer data has been our, our biggest hit so far. It seems that moving around a lot the night before predicts higher likelihood of suicide thinking the next day. Why? We don't know. We've just looked at the stream of data. It could be a person's agitation the night before, trouble moving, ar or moving around a lot, trouble sleeping, might predict. We're now looking at sleep data. People wear these continuously, so we're able to see how can we pull information from their devices, from their smartwatches, in a way that might help us better identify when they're at risk in time and place so that we can deploy interventions. And this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Traditionally, what we've done with people at risk for suicide when they're identified outside of treatment is refer them to crisis services. Right? If someone's at risk for suicide, call 1-800-SUICIDE, call Veterans Crisis Line, whatever the case is. And we should do this. A problem, though, is that many people may not use them, and we know from data many people don't use them. Around 10% of or so of people who are referred actually follow up with that and use it. What we've done historically is create what are called barrier reduction interventions broadly. If you think someone is in need of care, whether it be crisis services, psychotherapy, medication, we try and identify barriers to treatment, something we should all think about doing, and resolve those barriers. What might get in the way attitudinally, I think therapy is not going to work for me, or structurally, I can't get the treatment. Uh, my car doesn't work. I don't have reliable childcare. Can we identify barriers and remove them to increase people's likelihood of getting into treatment? One really nice and very infrequently cited study is my own dissertation, which was done some 14 <laughs> glorious years ago. Uh, with my brilliant advisor, Alan Kasdan. What we did in this study is a, we tested out a barrier reduction intervention for parents who were bringing their kids in for treatment of child conduct problems, aggressive oppositional behavior. Over the course of two years of my life, we randomly assigned 76 parents to get this barrier reduction intervention versus not. I'm happy to say that after two years, we found that parents who got this intervention were significantly more engaged in treatment. They came to more sessions. They adhered more to the treatment. So we had a positive effect. It was a, a brief 5 to 45 minute intervention administered over one to three sessions. So at the time, we thought this is a really brief, really light touch intervention. And we can really disseminate it. 60, 76 people in, in two years. This is great. Not so great uh, in hindsight. With digital interventions, we recently completed a similar study using new technology where we screened 40,000 people, we randomly assigned 1,500, administered a barrier reduction intervention, and it took five weeks to do. This is a really, a really clear example of how, with advances in technology, we can take a very similar intervention and modify it and scale it up and make it much more disseminable. So what we did was we teamed up with this platform called COCO, which is a social, uh, sorry, safety net for social networks. 
Uh, Coco is a platform that's been uh, teaming up with social media platforms, with messaging platforms, to use machine learning and AI methods to read over text, identify people at risk for suicide or other crises, and refer them to crisis services. So someone's texting, I want to kill myself, I'm depressed, a little bot will pop up on your text box and refer you to care. And so, so they've been running on a number, a number of different platforms. And so this is what there's a screen, this is actually from my own screen. Uh, if you, I will narrate this if you can't read it. This is a Coco bot. After someone's been identified as being at risk, the bot says, okay, you're, you're, you're not alone. We're gonna refer you to someone. What country are you in? I said, I'm in the US. They said, okay, please consider calling one of these crisis lines, crisis text line, national suicide prevention line, or so on. Pretty standard. Stuff like this happens all the time on social media platforms. If someone's identified as being at risk, they are referred to crisis services. I say, okay, Coco bot. It then says, so be honest. How likely are you to actually use these resources? Very likely or not likely? If I click very likely, we're done. If I click not likely, now I'm randomly assigned to get a barrier reduction intervention versus not. If I'm assigned to not get it, I say not likely, okay, we're done. If I'm assigned to the intervention, I next get a screen saying, okay, thanks for telling me this. We asked other people about potential barriers they might experience. Which of these are relevant for you? I just want to, I'm not going to call the crisis line. I'm unlikely to call it because I just want to chat. I can't use my phone right now. I don't want the police called. That's a common concern. So if I click on no police, I then get this little pop-up. This is the entirety of the intervention. Most callers to crisis centers do not end, most calls don't end with the police or paramedics showing up. This is extremely, extremely rare, like less than 1% rare for many crisis lines. This is often used by young people, so hence the like. Uh, I click on OK. That's the end of the intervention. Getting that intervention led to a 23% increase in people's actual likelihood of calling a hotline over the next few hours. So 23%. Big, not huge, but this is a totally free, totally cheap, totally scalable, totally automated intervention. The barrier piece may be relevant for people's clinical care. This is something that we should be doing. It's been shown in in-person, small, unimpressive dissertation studies to increase people's adherence. It's been shown in larger studies to increase people's uh, engagement with treatment. Identify barriers, help people resolve those barriers. So again, brief, fully automated, totally scalable just one type of intervention that we might use or how we might take it in, uh, existing interventions and modify them using new technologies to try and um, engage people more in treatment. And we have other interventions that we and others have been developing to send to people to, to more specifically target suicidal thinking, suicidal behaviors that have been shown to drive these things down as well. So I'm going to stop there so we have time for questions and conclude by summarizing what I hope to share, which is we have, with new advances, uh, the ability to predict these outcomes more accurately, for instance, using electronic health record data. I didn't talk much about some, some work that we're doing on social media to detect and predict these outcomes using uh, computer-based tasks. We can do better short-term prediction and prevention using mobile devices. What I haven't talked about and what I'm happy to talk about is areas that, for which we are facing major challenges and don't yet know the, 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 the clearest way forward. How do we deliver risk scores to clinicians? So for instance, using the, the machine learning model that I mentioned earlier where we have these risk scores, how do we tell clinicians about the risk score in a way that they can act on it? Do we tell patients or not? Do we tell a patient, we, you have a 90% chance of dying by suicide in the next year? Of course we should tell them. If someone's at such high risk, we should tell them. But we have 96% false positives. Is there, a, is there a negative effect to telling someone they're at risk for an outcome that is not gonna happen? So challenging on, on, uh, ethically. Which assessments, which interventions work best for which people? There's a really impressively growing literature on heterogeneity of treatment effects. A long-standing question in, in psychology and psychiatry, which treatments work best for which people? In just the past five or so years, really exciting advances using new statistics, statistical approaches, to match people to intervention in ways that seems to really boost effects. Uh, that, that approach hasn't really touched uh, this area yet. And what are the ethics of monitoring people and intervening implicitly. So we've been doing monitoring and intervention of people using uh, a very thorough consent process. Might we want to scale this up at some point? And you know, we're all being monitored by, pick whatever app you're using, Waze, Google, Facebook, so on, Snapchat. Your data are being used and sold and used to try and sell you things every day, and that's fine. As healthcare professionals, can we do the same thing? 
Should we do the same thing? Well, no, we have ethical obligation not to invade people's privacy and to let them know of the interventions they're getting, but how do we, how do we navigate this in a way that gets care to people and, uh, who need it and uh, engages them in, in, in treatment to try and drive down risk of suicide far beyond what we've done so far? So I'm going to stop there by thanking all of our sources of funding and our uh, amazing collaborators who contributed to all of this work. And uh, thank you again for having me here. And I look forward to trying to answer any questions you might have. I was just wondering if there's any data about how the repetition of questions about suicidal behavior increase the risk. I mean, patients who are fragile are very suggestible. They're very self-conscious. And I think in our field, we present suicide, our liability fears are so high sure. that we focus on this in, and we don't focus on other intervention. Mm -hmm. and other alternatives. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's any research on that. There is. Thank you for asking the question. Uh, this is a huge a question we get repeatedly, and a question that we ask ourselves repeatedly. If we are giving surveys on people's phones and asking six times a day, are you suicidal? How about now? How about now? How about now? How about now? Is this going to have an iatrogenic effect? Are people going to become more distressed and more suicidal? Uh, in the IAT and other tests we use, we present people with suicide-related words and other similar tasks, uh, images of skin that's been cut, and so on. Uh, pictures of nooses, pill bottles. So we've done, and others have done, experimental work to see, are we having an, a negative effect or a harmful effect on people? And the consistent answer is no. Uh, we don't see, over the course of doing survey studies on people's smartphone, any increase or decrease. Uh, some, uh, actually, at one of our, our IRBs suggested the opposite, they, surprisingly to me. They thought if you're asking people questions repeatedly, maybe they'll get a better understanding of their suicidal thinking, uh, they'll be less distressed by it, and their suicidal thoughts will come down. For better or worse, we've seen a pretty, as the data show, a pretty flat line over a one month period. Uh, and when we've done studies asking about distress, desire to die, uh, thoughts of death right before and right after showing people several hundred images or words, we see no increase in distress for people who have gotten these things. Suggesting that it is totally safe to ask people about suicide, to ask about it repeatedly. Uh, our research participants, and we've done this with, with people ages 10 through uh, their, their 70s, 80s, uh, it's safe to ask these questions. Yeah. Maureen, you have anyone on your side? No, anyone on my side? Oh, Sir? If you could stand up, keep it close to your mic. Good morning. morning. I'm wondering if you can address um, the prevalence rates of suicide among people with a history of non-suicidal self-injury. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I didn't talk today. I talked last night a bit about non-suicidal self-injury, uh, which refers to direct, deliberate destruction of body tissue in the absence of any intent to die. For a long time, these behaviors, suicidal and non-suicidal self-injury, were lumped together. And people called them deliberate self-harm or just self-harm. In the past 15 years or so, we've really understood that these are separate behaviors, uh, separate but related. So suicidal behavior, self-injury with some intention of dying, non-suicidal self-injury with no intention of dying. Although they are distinct and they have different base rates, they have different courses, they have different correlates, different responsiveness to treatment. For instance, DBT, really effective relative to other treatments of driving down suicide attempts, but not self-injury per se. Uh, although they are different, non-suicidal self-injury has emerged as a significant risk factor for suicide attempts. And there have now been a number of randomized trials showing that people who report self-injury, in some cases, self a history of self-injury is a stronger predictor of future suicide attempt than past suicide attempt, which has always been held up as the strongest risk factor for suicide attempts in, in kids. So they are related, they are distinct, but self-injury does significantly predict suicide attempt. You have a question over there by Maureen. Hi, thank you so much for uh, presenting today. I've learned a lot. Thank you. Um, I'm a clinician, and I was really impressed by the IAT um, task that you presented and found myself wondering a little bit about the practical implications of that. When I think about people coming in who are suicidal or having suicidal thinking and sitting down and doing a task like that, mm -hmm. I found myself going, how does that work or how would mm -hmm. that work? And I'm wondering, as you think forward, um, how you think that could be translated into an actual clinical opportunity for people in a setting outside of a lab. Yes. G great question. So. I think it would be perfectly appropriate to sit down with someone, with a patient, 
and go to the Project Implicit website and go you know, talk with them about implicit cognitions and about how people think about suicide and self-injury, suicide if that's the case, how these thoughts can ebb and flow and how things like the IET can give us, can give us a read on a person's suicidal thoughts. It's not perfectly accurate and it's not predictive in an individual case. So we're showing our group averages uh, and it's one piece of the puzzle. So I would let a person, and we try and do a good job in this in the sort of debriefing material saying, here's what this score means, here's what it doesn't mean. But it's perfectly safe and appropriate to use and to, to, to use with a patient. We haven't done the individual level prediction with it yet, so I wouldn't draw too many strong inferences from a person's score. For instance, when I take the IAT, this IAT, I tend to score fairly high on it. Not to overdisclose, I've never struggled with thoughts of suicide, but I think about suicide and I identify as a suicide researcher, so suicide does equal me to a large extent, and so my score comes out as high. It doesn't tell us, is this person gonna be suicidal? It just tells us how much are they, how quickly are they classifying these things, so I don't wanna over, oversell it. We are, though, given its predictive ability, trying to think of exactly this. How can we incorporate this into clinical care? And so we're just finishing a study. We haven't published anything from it yet where we brought the IIT, uh, a few other tests, and some, some of our best self-report questions and our machine learning methods on medical records as a package into the emergency room. And we just did data collection on 2,000 people to see can we create a 15-minute risk calculator that uses these different, you know, it's an IAT, it's several of our best questions, it combs the medical record, puts this all together into one score that we can give to a clinician. So when someone's in the waiting room to be, waiting to be seen, you hand them an iPad, they fill this stuff out, they do the IAT, and then the clinician gets a score. So they get a, 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 a scientific prediction on what is this individual person's likelihood of making a suicide attempt in the next one week, one month, six months. And so that's the goal, and we're iteratively getting there, but we're not quite there yet. But in the meantime, perfectly safe to talk with people about and, and, um, and to use. Maureen, you have a question up there in the corner? And I saw someone's hand wave at me. I'll get you next, sir, after her. And then Matt, the other thing, I was wondering if we, if we have time, it's only five after 10, depending on how many more questions. Not to be presumptuous, but I think people might be interested in the two by two grid that you and Matt did, or Mitch did, before that you did last night. Yes. Um, Although it's on my other computer and the computer's okay, not so, working with this cord. All right, never mind. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I can describe it. I know, but that's kind of, oh, sorry, go ahead, sir. Hi. Um, have these ER studies and Army studies, have they been generalizable to children and adolescents as well? E yes. So there is a, the, Inpatient study, the inpatient work, yes, and the smartphones work, yes. So we've published so far studies with kids as young as 12, and we have studies now ongoing in, in a few local um, inpatient units in Boston with uh, adolescents as young as 10 and adults going up to, again, 70s, 80s. Um, in e so we're, the, the study I just described in ERs with 2,000 participants, we did it in an adult ER. There's a similar study called the, the ED-STAR study, it's a multi-site study done, I think a dozen ERs, uh, pediatric ERs around the country where they did something similar. Uh, quick battery of qu self-report questions and then implicit association test to try and predict which kids are at risk for suicide attempts and suicide death after they leave the hospital. And data collection has just gotten wrapped up and so the first few papers on this will be coming out uh, over the next months and, and, and years. And so the work's being done but it's just starting to get into the, into the literature. So I imagine it will take a few, you know, a few years after that to really get into the, the, the clinical front lines. Okay, Matt, right here. If you could stick up and keep the microphone close to your phone. Thank you very much. Um, in the early part of your presentation, you had mentioned that one of the strongest predictors of suicide attempts is being in treatment. Yes. Um, can you talk at all about the predictors of suicide attempts for those that are not yet in treatment so that we could refer those uh, at risk to treatment? Yeah, I don't know of any, it's a great question. I don't know of any work that looks at predictor, the differences between predictors of those in versus not in treatment. Uh, and for kids, for instance, the, the majority of kids who are suicidal in the community, 60 to in the 70s percent are, have been in treatment. So the good news is we're, we, in the US at least, are doing a pretty good job of getting people at risk, people with suicidal thoughts and behaviors into treatment. Uh, the downside is a lot of them are still suicidal and are still dying by suicide. There has been some work, uh, Ron Kessler has a really nice paper that was published in the past year or so on using machine learning methods of peop on people in treatment 
how can we use data from up until today to predict this person's likelihood of making a suicide attempt in the next, you know, before the next session, before the next two sessions, and so on. Um, so people are starting to, I think your question is an interesting one, important one. I just don't know any work on people not yet in treatment. Important to dig in on, and people are already digging in on, of people in treatment. So if they're already coming to us, what predicts whether, you know, who's most at risk? Maureen, she's got you. I was uh, intrigued by uh, the social media with the pings six times a day, which I'm not sure how much I would like that, but <laughs> I'm wondering how much of the intervention is due to being asked and how much is like a Hawthorne effect kind of we're being studied so we act differently? Yeah, to, great question. And to be clear, if I wasn't earlier, not, it's not an intervention. Right now it's just in a, a monitoring study. So what we're doing as a first step is uh, monitoring people to see what do these thoughts look like as people have them. We then want to, once we have a good sense of how to best predict high risk periods, then start beaming interventions. So the intervention, inter intervention work that I showed is separate from that right now, just to be clear. Uh, yeah, there could be a Hawthorne effect. There could, there, you, right now we haven't yet teased apart, is this what suicidal thoughts really look like or is this only what they look like by monitoring? And it's hard to do because how do you know what they look like unless you do the monitoring study? Uh, to get at this question a little bit and the first question, is there any kind of negative impact of doing the monitoring? What we are going to do is an experiment of monitoring people and not monitoring people and then doing like monthly check-ins to see is there some driving down of suicidal thoughts at monthly check-ins for people who got daily monitoring in between? And we're also just about to start um, bursting studies where instead of asking people once every few hours, we're asking every five minutes to try and get a sort of a fine or grand sense of how suicidal thoughts ebb and flow. And we can do experiments in there as well to see does doing this bursting, if we're asking every five minutes, does this really ramp up people's suicidal thinking? And to be clear, a lot of this is happening clinically in my experience anyway. There's hospitals that we work with that do five minute checks on kids to see how they're doing. And from all that I've seen, rare is it that, that those data are actually collected and analyzed. So in hospital settings, for instance, there's often regular check-ins, but we haven't yet um, harvested those data to see what can they tell us about suicidal thinking, how best should we intervene, and how should we do it in a way that's not going to uh, make things worse. A lot of open questions. I have a question here. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm curious a little bit more about the intervention side of things. I think we're sort of talking about really great risk um, prediction, mm -hmm. and then I'm thinking about the implicit association test and all these other pieces, but it sounds like a lot of these people that are still committing suicide are are in therapy um, and or, you know, after being in a psychiatric hospitalization, there's a burst after exiting that, and so even anecdotally or, or preliminarily, is there any more information about specifics of what we can do once we are doing a better job of identifying these at-risk people. Yeah. <laughs> what can you do? I, I, you know, I think do our best to use the systems that we have in place. So things like DBT, cognitive therapy. I think, uh, I think and there's some data supporting this, uh, perhaps a really important ingredient, taking DBT for instance, is that there's ongoing monitoring and high accessibility of a clinician. Uh, I think traditionally what we do is bring people into the hospital, which removes them away from the environment that they were struggling in, and it's got its pros and cons, and then a releasing of people from 24-hour care to once a week, or a re recommendation for once a week care. And, and I'm not picking any individual healthcare system or clinic, just not always a lot of follow-up. So w where we're putting our efforts is, can we do a much more intensive follow-up during that transition? From when you're in the hospital, from 24-hour care, to one hour a week care. That's a huge gap and a huge you know, transition of removal of services and back out into the setting that you were in before. Can we use, for instance, the monitoring work that we're doing to provide a closer touch with people? And can we experiment with more wraparound care? Uh, essentially do the things that I do and maybe you do with loved ones who, you know, if I have a, a, a friend who lives in a, a different state, Rather than saying, I'll call you once a week, if I'm worried about them, what I do is call them, refer them to a clinician, try to really work hard to find a clinician where they are, follow up to see that they like that clinician, what kind of barriers do they experience to working with that clinician, how are they doing in between sessions, and so on. Just providing much more of a scaffolding. Uh, I would be, I'm an advocate for doing things differently than we have been doing them. Using the systems we have in place, 
but then fiddling to try and find out where there's gaps and do more enhanced care. As an example, and do more experimental work with the, the, the treatments we have. We haven't done any experiments with hospital care, for instance. No one's done the randomized trial saying, should we send people to a hospital or not? And some say, well, we can't do that because that's like doing a randomized trial of parachutes. We know they work, and so and to, and to assign people to not get one is assigning people to death. We don't know they work. It could be, there's, a, there's a lot in the history of medicine where we, we knew it worked, and then someone did the experiment, and it turns out it was harmful. So maybe <coughs> hospitalization is harmful. There's a recent study by a guy named Dennis Ogeron, who's in the UK, where healthcare works different. A primary care team or clinician can admit someone to an inpatient unit, bypassing the ER. So the clinical team in the community can say, this person needs more care, I am sending them to the hospital. Once they're in the hospital, and this is a paper published in Lancet in the past year or two, the hospital makes a determination about whether this person should stay in the hospital or whether they should go home. And if they go home, they get wraparound care. Clinicians come to their house, check in on them, try and change the environment in a way that makes it really supportive. Kind of like a, what in our country would be like multi-systemic therapy. And they found that there was no difference between kids who were in the hospital versus not when they got the wraparound care. Couldn't we do something similar here? Not getting into healthcare and repayment and all that stuff. <laughs> which is a huge issue. But if, if we could do something like that, that might go a long way. So this is what I mean when I'm trying, to be con I'm trying to be concrete when I say we should do things differently. This is the kind of thing I think we could experiment with. Doing the things that are probably more intuitive to a lot of people in this room. We have the system we're working in. How can we change this in a way that is more rational, provides more support when and where and how people need it? I'm struck, Matt, by um, both the piece about DBT, about the, um, the emphasis of phone contact, a yeah. lot of phone work that DBT therapists do with clients, and then also thinking about your data that you showed about the perhaps protective factor of those who are in a lot of text contact and phone contact with others versus those who are not in that kind of contact. Yeah. And I'm wondering if something could be devised just to try as um, clinicians Understanding, of course, that they also have to have lives, <laughs> yeah. and at some point they have to be not working. Uh, but looking at the piece of uh, maybe even some kind of um, beginning with kind of like automated check-ins, where it's a daily thing, where you're just inquiring, like you know, how's your day today? If which wouldn't have to be each clinician constantly writing the text fresh yes. each time. Yes. But if then and then as they get that feedback, that then there can either be opportunities for follow-up or additional that even just the quasi-forced interaction on a certain level or, or even then suggestions of, you know, have you texted your brother today, you mentioned mm -hmm. yesterday, to, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if you, I'm just an amateur pretending. No, to. no, this, this, is, this is exactly what we are currently doing uh, starting tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> well, so, <then>. so <laughs> a lot of our monitoring, you should join the team. A lot of the monitoring work we've been doing has been of people while they're in an inpatient unit, which is, fine and safe to do, and if someone says on their survey, 10 out of 10, I intend to kill myself today, we tell the clinical staff. The clinical staff often says, I know they're suicidal, that's why they're in the hospital. But we want to report back to the clinicians in case they weren't aware of the high level of risk. Starting tomorrow, we're, we're monitoring people outside the hospital. And that gets to be very scary. So what do you do if a patient says, a person says, 10 out of 10, I intend to kill myself today. And you have an app on their phone and a GPS tracker and you know where they are. Well, of course, you send an ambulance. But it turns out about 5% of the surveys we get, think back to that group of red boxes. People say, 8, 9, 10 into 10, I'm pretty sure I'm going to kill myself today. And none of, no people in our study so far have killed themselves. And there have been very few suicide attempts. So how do you manage the fact that some people are walking around with what seems like pretty high levels of suicidal thinking? We can't call every person every time. And we can't send an ambulance. And we shouldn't send an ambulance every time. So what we're doing is trying to build an automated system to help people manage their own risk, to say, to, you know, and we can do this with new technology. We're starting to build this ourselves. We have programmers who are building uh, logic to say, if a person's score is X, have a pop-up and an interactive screen that does Y, so people can manage their risk, and they can contact us, and we get contacted if they're above a certain threshold. Right. Might we be able to then translate that into something ready for clinical care? We've been doing work on monitoring like this for about 10 years now, and I used to start out saying to clinicians, isn't this great? You can not only see your patient once a week, but you can get real-time information about exactly their level of suicide <laughs> risk. Exactly. And most clinicians say, no, we, it's a lot, we're dealing with a lot right now. Yes, we want to help people, but we just can't manage that risk. And we're seeing that our, ourselves now, monitoring dozens of patients at a time who are at really high risk, 
It's impossible. It takes a lot of time for humans to do. And I'd argue it might be more effective and it's certainly more efficient if we can automate a lot of it. Yeah. So if a person says 10 out of 10 on their survey right now at 10, 15 in the morning and they're in school and they're a teacher, they don't want to talk to us on the phone. They don't want us sending an ambulance. Wouldn't it be nice if there's a little pop-up that can walk them through, uh, that can surface their safety plan, walk them through some skills, connect them with a friend, have a, you know, a quick button to call someone. Let's see if we can scaffold as much as possible, automate as much as possible uh, so that we can help people help themselves and have clinicians be pinged when needed in case of emergency and not to try and manage every single potential crisis. Uh, Alex, if you can come towards me, I'll meet you halfway. Thanks. Thanks again for your presentation, Dr. Nock. So uh, as a psychiatrist, I, as you just said, trying to manage risk is a challenge. I do everything I can, and as I'm sure most of the clinicians in the room here would agree, to keep kids, especially out of the hospital. Uh, but sometimes they're hospitalized because me as a clinician, their parents say, we're just too concerned. We can't sleep outside of their room five nights in a row. You know, they're self-harming, other things like that. So sometimes they're hospitalized and then they can come to a program like a partial hospitalization, intensive outpatient program. And that is some wraparound care, but inevitably a stressor occurs, a breakup, a bad grade, AP tests, they are at risk again. So my question is, do you find that after a re-hospitalization, the spike is persistent. So do they have the same risk of attempting or completing suicide after the first hospitalization hmm. if they're re-hospitalized? Because sometimes, especially with adolescents, the stressors are gonna continue, high school's tough, and so we're presented with that even if they have wraparound care. So I'm yeah. wondering if you have any data about that. I don't, it's a really, really good question of what is the, what happens to that spike on repeat hospitalizations? Does it increase, does it decrease? Uh, as a person moves through that system? It's a fantastic question, I just don't know. But we can test it out. And I appreciate that you don't overreach. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, why don't we call it a day? Wait, there's someone up there, one more. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I well, didn't I spot it. I'm sorry. I'm not very good at this. <laughs> sorry, you are good at this. Maybe that person can come towards you. Hi, Dr. Nock, thank Hi. you for your presentation. Just a clarification of your Army data at the beginning, that first category that was such a high number, um, did, were those people just, they had more risk factors or was it a combination of particular risk factors? Particular risk factors. And can you name what those were? Uh, they were things that would not surprise you, things like uh, uh, bipolar disorder, mood disorder, um, substance use disorders, and so on, and dem some demographic factors. Okay, but, thank so you. So combination of factors, but the factors are weighted. And some are more predictive, some are less predictive. Okay, good. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank Thanks. you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much.